So today, a leaden sky, and um, just uh, the proclaimers obviously in town. Um, virtually no wind at the start, but as we headed towards the coast, a westerly blew up and it's been a bit of a test uh, turning itself into a headwind for our breakaway. We do have a breakaway. S seven, eight riders, in fact, are up the road. Who's going to stop them? Well, it may well be that the chase does produce a bunch sprint. We've had that uh, in three of the last four years, so Viviani might have an option. He hasn't quite stopped sulking since the World Track Championships, where he really did want um, Omnium Gold. Didn't quite happen, happen for him. And then since that time, Viviani's been... Uh, not quite his, um, his chipper self. Let's see how he goes today. Others with options, of course, Orica Green Edge. They've got a quick man in uh, Mezgetz, who may go very well indeed. Don't write off uh, any of the major teams, especially if it gets a bit brutal at the end. We may get rain. And uh, the likes of Lampre Marina, as we watch BMC come through here, Sasha Madolo has got to be a decent call. BMC felt sent a very much a time trialing profile to this race and Taylor Finney yesterday was really stretching his legs ahead of the classics as if uh, just wanting to test himself out. Stephen King there just coming through and the Etics quick step. They did a lot of work yesterday hoping to keep Tony Martin close to the front. Um, the idea of course to uh, keep him near enough to actually pose a challenge and a threat to the title itself when we get to the individual time trial. Um, Tony Martin finishing 44 seconds down, so it's not all over for Tony Martin, but he needs to find some space over Christoph, and that's an unlikely thing. Katusha then cock a hoop, and so um, the team from Russia, much happier than the team from Kazakhstan, who uh, I imagine there was several bread buns thrown at the dinner table last night. As our leader, albeit emblazoned with a, uh, a gilet for Katusha, but you can see the orange and white leader's jersey. And the team that feel most aggrieved, Astana. What on earth went wrong? Just about everything, Magnus Baxter. Well, definitely, I'd say uh, everything went wrong, and um, I think more of a lack of com communication and direction from uh, from the sport director to, as to what they were actually supposed to do up there. Mm. Uh, in my eyes, they uh, they could have done an awful lot better with that one, and um, potentially set up new Vestra for uh, um, almost a. An unattainable uh, lead in this in, in this race. Strange, well, as, as it happened, they uh, dis decided to have a discussion. One wanted to sprint, and the other one wanted to ride for general classification. And uh, uh, when you leave Alexander Kristoff with that kind of a thing, then uh, he's just going to have you for it. Certainly is. Um, just look at the Hellingen, which are listed there for you. Sadly, you join us having um, with the Kemmelberg uh, already dealt with. In fact, it's um, several kilometers behind us in fact all of the five climbs have now been dealt with today unfortunately um, it's rough out there as you can see and the ditches are wet and really quite nasty um, everybody here by the way despite this um, the look of this actually got back on the bikes and rode on you'll be pleased to know so no injuries but uh, just shows you on the slippy muddy roads look how narrow it is narrowed even further by the uh, debris that's been dragged on Magnus yeah, it definitely is uh, an issue when you're racing in Belgium and, uh, and these kind of roads, they, um, they're, they're, there's quite a, a number of them about. So uh, it's, it's part of what you have to, to learn to deal with when you're racing up here. And uh, at the same time, crashes like this are always going to happen. It, it's, it's been happening for, for a long time and uh, they're bound to continue to happen. But here we go. Some pictures from, uh, from the Kemmelberg, yeah. the one that they're using in Wevelgem. A little bit earlier. Um, the Kemmelberg, as uh, Magnus quite rightly said, this is a bit of a tribute day to the Gen Bevel Gem. Um, as you can see, paved on top now, so not quite as bad as it used to be. In fact, some of the cobbled descents that really took prisoners have kind of been ironed out of the race, haven't they, Magnus? Yeah, they have been. Uh, there used to be a massive descent, a very fast descent on cobblestones underneath the trees and... Um well, there was a couple of very nasty falls there in the past. Even, um, even when it was clean, it was kind of still slimy, wasn't it? It was still very slimy, very difficult to uh, to, to deal with. And uh, I've been one of the people that has uh, slid down that uh, particular descent on my backside back in uh, in '97. And uh, I got to tell you, it's not a pleasant thing to do. So I'm I'm very happy that they've now extended it and and taken it around on this relatively small and narrow road still, but. Uh, much, much safer than going down the cobblestone. Mm. Magnus so. occasionally does close his eyes and he can still feel the lumps, <laughs> if only in his own imagination. 
Uh, today we've got, uh, as we'll re rejoin our breakaway, they've got five minutes with 86 Ks to go. Now, yesterday it was a similar scenario, and the breakaway, um, after a few reformations, did manage to actually hold on. And there you go, even in uh, on dry conditions, it can catch a few out, and that was uh, Roman Cardis just taking a tumble next to the tree. The he flag... lost about two spots there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did, because everyone was going so carefully. He, he probably could have... Uh, Climbed off, bought an ice cream, got back on, and he still would have been uh, within catching distance. Um, 86.4 kilometres to go, five minutes the gap. It was uh, nudging towards the eight-minute mark. It seems the chase has finally engaged, and it's likely to now, Magnus. This is no great gap with largely flat lands, albeit with some pave uh, to deal with. We've been over one flat pave section of 250 metres at uh, Bellestrat. The next one is not going to be for about 23 or 22 k's, and then we get a series uh, of three of them before we hit our laps, finally. Yeah, we do, um, but certainly the bunch is uh, looking like it's splitting up here, and uh, Katusha on the front driving this one hard now for uh, our lead man in the leader's jersey. Yet, uh, a fair amount of crosswind, and uh, they decided to, to put the uh, put the hammer down. It's a good time to attack, actually, especially when you suddenly come to exposed areas. If you know the race as well, Magnus, you can kind of map into your uh, um, your day the attack points, and some of them just like emerging from a copse of trees. You can go, and suddenly uh, the wind is going to take some prisoners behind you. Yeah, that's why you have to be so vigilant to uh, to wind direction and uh, the, the direction of the race as well. And, and it's one of the things that the sport directors and te uh, team managers in the back of the car have to uh, come up with and, and uh, relay that information to the riders. When is it possible to do an attack and, uh, uh, you know, actually organize the, the, the riders? Because a sustained effort like this into the crosswind, there's just a question of time before that really just uh, blows wide open. And uh, we can see already the stragglers down the back of the of the bunch here, that, and we haven't been going for that long into uh, this crosswind section. Uh, these guys have just taken on the Bellastrat cobbles. You probably saw it. It was a flat section of uh, just 250 metres in town, and they looked like modern cobbles, if I can say that. Uh, generally, they tend to be uh, created from concrete, and they have better grip than the shiny cobbles. Uh, which were hewn from granite all those years ago. Lars Bohm started off as one of the pre-race favourites. Um, not sure now, to be honest, after yesterday, seeing how he was going, but you can pick it up, but frankly, Christoph looks like he may well be over the hill, to, so to speak. Yeah, I think Lars Bohm is going to find it difficult to uh, to make any time up on uh, on a couple of the guys uh, sort of further up on the general classification. I mean, he's a very classy rider, and you can see he's... Uh, although they're putting on the pressure in the front here, he's still sitting there um, relatively from, well, dead last wheel bit, really, and he's still looking pretty comfortable. But I've got to say, uh, at some point here, if the wind continues like this, um, he's going to need to move up if he's got any kind of aspirations on, uh, on staying into this race. Interesting to see Danny Van Poppel right up here. He's back from injury, don't forget. He looks reasonably sprightly as well as uh, everyone tries to hang on to the coattails of Katusha, who, of course, are working for our leader, Alexander Kristoff. It's very pacey, and there's been some splits here. Yeah, Kristoff there on the left-hand side of your picture, on the bike path there, on and off the bike path, I've got to say, and uh, there you go. This is what happens when uh, when the pressure is being put on. The um, It's interesting watching the um, the Katusha riders, though, they're moving themselves so that only Kristoff has actually got the space on the road. Ian Stanner is also being distanced here now. Um, but to put themselves in a position where it's only Christoph is the last man on the road and then everyone else has to fight for position behind him. And um, that's the way to really do this kind of crosswind races and, and let riders, um, everyone, to sort of hurt in the wind, basically. And they are hurting as well. Flores hurts in the gutter at the moment. If you get disengaged from the train as well, suddenly you're taking the wind on your own, and uh, it's a tough ask to get back in, Magnus. You have to put a lot of energy in. You'll see other riders on the left-hand side of our screen just freewheeling. They're in the house, so to speak. You do have to battle to get back in if you're in the wind, don't you? Yeah, you do, and uh, you can see even though if you're getting back into the wheels, there's still not really any position where you can hide yourself until you get into now what seems to be more of a, cro uh, a tailwind section or cross tailwind at which point you, you really got to make, continue that sustained effort that you've been doing, try and move up and get yourself up, even if this feels like you haven't got the legs or the, the, the power to do it, you've still got to try and move yourself up further because there's only a question of time in, in this part of the world before we turn a bit again and uh, all of a sudden we're straight into the next, um, the next crosswind section. 
Um, if you're ever wondering just how much wind is off or protection is offered up by the wind, it's essentially a windscreen when you've got a, a whole uh, cross section, a phalanx of riders in front of you that you are hiding behind. And if you want to know the effect of the wind, even if you're just driving along modestly, um, get a quiet road before you do this, by the way, but uh, pick out one of those big road maps and hold it out the window. And you'll see just that, the size of that takes an awful lot of uh, the wind impact and you get a great deal of protection if you are within the pack here. But what you want to do when they, uh, when like the Katusha riders have been doing now, they've been keeping it into, into the gutter and allowing a certain amount of riders, then all of a sudden you open up and there's more riders then very happy to take their turns. We're going to take ourselves a break. As Aston are, I think probably with the whip hand cracking above them, come to the fore. Welcome back. Just been checking in and having a look at Andre Greipel, who looks frankly ripped and ready to do something spectacular today. Uh, we're going to uh, Poporinga. Basically, you just put it on your finger and then take it off. It's a, a local sport. Uh, 79.6 kilometres to go, 4 minutes and 29. And our breakaway, um, they've had a reasonable amount of fun. I'm not sure how much it feels uh, like a, a laughing matter as we speak. But they have dealt with all of the climbs. And now we may start to get thoughts of a selection. Pim Lickdart is in the break, then is in a happy place. 27 year old. He just rolled off the nose of the breakaway group, as you can see, and uh, he's with Ivar Zlik. There he is, Mr. Zlik, in his orange of Rompot. He's just 22 years of age. Good breakaway rider, as uh, many of the Rompot boys are, and he's also joined by top sport Vladen, and I think this is Van Leerbecher. It is indeed. Um, you can see distanced for the time being, trying to get back in Tonelli of Bardiani, along with uh, Julian Maurice of Direct Energy, who's also in the original breakaway. And Zolioli of Nipovini Fantini. I think he may well have gone backwards, but we haven't got a close up of that at the back. They've been up the road for quite some time, Magnus. It's a, it's a tall order on a day like this to go from the very start. A long day and a tough day at 211 kilometres. Yeah, it is. It is a, a tough day, this one, and um, it's it's a very early move that they're making as well in, in splitting that group up. It's still got 78 kilometres to go, so um, they must be feeling very strong. And uh, it, by the looks of it, it's it's actually just split in the crosswind rather than um, being some form of an attack that having been made. Mm. Well, it's a decent trio up front. Van Lerbiger, um Bert, to his mates. Of top sport bladder and on the front at the moment now he has been very busy in the brakes for all races concerned by a uh, top sport bladder and whenever that's faced with world tour teams the likes of uh, top sport and of course of rompot really like to show their jerseys but also show what they can do and uh, you know for the individual cyclists concerned especially if they're youngsters like uh, zlick is he's only 22 um He's essentially just saying, listen, don't forget about me to uh, all teams who are watching this. Yeah, correct. He, 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 it is an opportunity to show yourself and show what you've got in your legs and uh, certainly doing it, pulling the break away like this. And if you can sustain it for a, a long enough period of time and really make the, uh, the World Tour teams struggle to bring you back, then uh, it's something where um, the teams take notice and, uh, and keep an eye, extra eye on, on that young rider. I've got to say, Zlik looks, he looks like a quick rider. Um, it's strange, in the world of motorsport, they say, if it looks fast, it probably is fast. Um, how do you... I know <laughs> it doesn't it's, quite work it, in cycling. It doesn't quite work, <laughs> I know, in cycling, but um, what catches your eye apart from results with it, within a rider? Do you actually look for core strength and you actually see that... Does style count for something in your mind? Not necessarily the style, um, but it, it's more down to ability, um, you know, being able to ride hard for a longer period of time, and obviously the results do count into it, but um, also at, at, at points it's your tactical awareness, your, um, you know, just how you carry yourself uh, overall. Um, but yeah, sitting well or good on the bike is always going to help, and it's, mm. always, it's going to be uh, easier to work with a rider like that, but... Nowadays, also, if you're looking at signing a, a young rider, you look at the, um, the power data, you, you, you sort of get in contact with that young rider and, and get all of his power data, and you analyze that and see whether there's uh, a potential of building further from, from where they are or whether they've actually just about reached their, their, their maximum capacity. Uh, and if there is uh, 
you know, a rider that, that you can work with and, and bring them on further, then uh, that's going to come down to, uh, yeah, does it fit in with our team? And have we got another five, six, seven, ten guys that are doing exactly the same as him? Or is he someone who does a, something that we really need um, to, to strengthen our team with? Uh, and that's, that's an important factor in, in all of it. And, and also something that the, the, the riders themselves need to be vigilant about. Um, you might get a contract offer from, from one of the biggest teams in the world, but if you've got another 10 guys that do exactly the same as you do, then is it really worth taking that, that, that contract with our team or is it worth looking for something else? Although sometimes slightly, slightly less paid, but you might get the opportunity to do what you do well uh, more often and be supported by the team and give it another year or two and, and uh, the contract that you've been offered from the bigger teams are then two, three times the, the amount that they were when they first wanted to sign you. Uh, so it's kind of speculating and, and accumulating uh, to, so to it an extent. Is, it, is, it is possible to actually plan for the future with the rider who's maybe not producing the results for the time being, but you can see potential. And you can see it in style, in numbers, in all kinds of things. Yeah, definitely. Oh. It's, it's, uh, it's a full package that you're looking for. And I think um, it, it's more... Uh, uh, more so nowadays than it than used to be. I mean, back uh, a, a number of years back now, it was more a question of, has he done the result? Is he, is he good enough? Mm. And uh, at that point, you sign the rider and uh, you sign him slightly more blind than what, you, what, what they are now with all the data that, that is, uh, is backing these riders up. I used to live not that far away from here and in fact spent about six years. And at this time of year, there is, you think, oh, lovely, open countryside, fresh air, forget it. What you actually smell is the slightly sweet, slightly pungent smell of chicken manure, which is being spread upon the fields, mixed with water on a warm day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if the wind's wrong, it's, it's, a, it's it not can, your party, I can tell you. Might, the smell might not be so bad, but it stings a bit in your eyes. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it is gaseous. Let's put it that way. Look at the leader. Look at the far left-hand side of your screen. You'll see Tony Martin wanting a bit of a view. Um, somebody said, big question for today. Is Tony Martin wearing his sunspec? No, he's not. <laughs> he's, decided, he's decided to go bare-eyed, even with the um, chicken manure gas, which is starting to pick up right now as the uh, sun comes out, the temperatures rise. It's a funny old smell. And if you once, once smelt, never forgotten, I think, isn't it? Mate? I think so, yeah. <laughs> 74.6 <laughs> kilometers to go. I don't know where all those chickens come from, but anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, four minutes and 32. And as you can see, some splits going on as uh, we get ourselves out into the exposed areas. We've seen several groups now. Uh, but Christoph, the pace that they put in and Aston are joining the fun. Let's dwell on them, shall we, for a moment. I know that yesterday they messed it up. When you're a DS, what do you have to say to them? Uh, Zanini, of course, and uh, Stangieri will have, uh, I, I think, possibly thrown a bit of porridge about. Uh, I, I certainly would have hoped to, because in, in my book, that was um, inexcusable in terms of how they, they handled that, um, the final sort of 20, 30 kilometers with, uh, with Alexander Kristoff. There was no need to drag Kristoff into, into the finish. Um, they should have just, done a one-two on him and, and uh, effectively dropped him at some point and certainly I think Leo Vestra um, had he committed to it on one of the climbs there I, I reckon he would have dropped um, dropped Christoph quite relatively easy to to be honest look at the splits we're getting here Magnus and it's only the start of this with 73.7 kilometers to go and the wind clear at the moment is a headwind um, but it and it's likely to be that for much of uh, the rest of this race until we get to our laps that will be in 40 kilometers time. The laps, the three of them, are 11.2 per lap. They basically circulate by the coast, and so of course you get winds in all directions. It's a south, it's a westerly, a west-south westerly, and it's quite stiff breeze today. More than that, it's having an impact. Yeah, it is having an impact. But if we're looking at the direction that we're traveling, we're going to be going in in, in this direction for a very long time now. So. Uh, I think get the, guys, the guys better get used to it <laughs> and uh, and find themselves a nice little spot to uh, to try and hide for a bit. Uh, it, it's likely to, uh, we're, although we're seeing a group on, his, on its way back into uh, into what, well, should we call that a peloton or a, or a larger group? Um, but it, 
I, I think we, we've still got uh, an awful lot of uh, crosswind racing to be done today. Um, a lot of you have been asking questions still, front puncture, um, here from our friend from Vini Fantini. It's uh, Ryan Anderson, I think. Is it? No. Uh, I beg your pardon. It's De Negri. Of course it is. Ryan Anderson, direct energy. Forgive me. Um, a lot of questions about motorcycles and decorum. There was a big meeting before this race, and there is a big meeting every night to tell the, uh, just to warn uh, motorcycles and cars about the impact of their presence. There was a VIP car yesterday that really made a nuisance of himself. I posted uh, actually pictures of what we saw during one of the commercial breaks uh, so that you can all catch up with just how silly that person is. He's off the race. Bye bye. See you never. Um, so not in that role anyway. And that's what needs to be happening, Magnus, is you get it wrong, you're gone. And your participation within the race is suspended forthwith. There's yeah, lives at risk here. Yeah, there definitely are. And uh, I think that's uh, it's a good call that they've made to uh, to take that rider off the race. If the riders do something wrong, they get they get thrown off the race. So why not have the same kind of scenario happening here? And uh, yeah. There is just no no need for, uh, for for moving certainly for a VIP car to move move past the riders that that closely or quickly. Um, at certain points, I do understand that um, even the, the the safety motorbikes need to need to get there. And <laughs> oh dear! Come on, fellas. Well, that's an expulsion. Yeah. And you know what? He, that now being on screen, that rider is going to be called out of this race very very soon indeed. And look, is this is this retribution happening right now? A uh, bit of a bit of a chat. What do you think you're doing? You're on camera now <laughs> They've got to resist the temptation for retaliation here because I believe Katusha are going to be a man down after that You cannot strike somebody especially no. when it's in full view of the race director And I've seen it before they they get their crossed arms and away you go Yeah, yeah I, I wonder how long that time that will take but um, I don't know what's been going on But it's some certainly something and I wonder whether whether one of the uh, direct energy riders there have, have got straight into uh, into the mix of the Katusha team and, and messing with the uh, with the lineup there. But regardless of that, you never take your handlebar uh, hands off the handlebars to um, to, to, to do something like that because what's going to happen is that all of a sudden he they both crash and uh, take out the half of the rest of the peloton. Exactly. So I think we're waiting for an expulsion from Katusha. Welcome back, just under 70 kilometers, uh, four and a half minutes is the gap, but it's from uh, what is now a selection from our breakaway. And the star turn within it, I think it's fair to say, amongst all of them, is Pim Lichtart. He's clearly head and shoulders above the rest of the breakaway riders in terms of Palmares and indeed capability, and it's he they're worrying about. Yeah, I think uh, it probably is him that, <laughs> that they are worrying about. Um, although there's an awful lot of racing left to be done there is an awful lot of racing to be done and indeed uh, time running out on a three-day race to actually get something out of it it's not just about condition checking ahead of the tour of flanders and indeed roubaix and the rest of the classics it's uh, it's more than that it's early part of the season and you want to find out how you're rolling heading through one of the uh, smaller towns there's actually some remarkably small cities here uh, due to the fact that they've had a cathedral plonk there in ancient times so cathedral cities I think it's fair to say as you can see beaming back to base this is uh, Fabio Sabatini he's one of the lead out men for Marcel Kittel so they won't want him to have too much of a problem uh, it's clearly a technical I think he's going to be getting back in as soon as he can um, yeah looking to get rid of possibly his own rain jacket and maybe that of some of his teammates uh, but Sabatini is uh, the last man but one standing Richesi will be leading Kittel if Kittel is feeling up to the uh, strains of the day and ethics quick step want to get something out of it we we're just discussing a few moments ago that uh, time's running out for teams on a very short three-day race to actually test themselves I guess and um, elevated company Orica Green Edge are here and they've got Luca Mezgetz now he's new to cobbles but he went well at Game Bevergo and finished fifth and so Mezgetz is comfy on this surface that he's had to deal with I know there's very few cobbles left but he's had a few um, what I'm trying to say is he's quite adaptable to new situations and he's quick so Orica have got an option there 
Yeah, I think he, they've definitely got an option we'll look at today. Um, he's, he's certainly uh, fast enough and um, has proven to be so in the past as well. So um, I think they do well to, uh, to keep him looked after today. Um, Carol Hancock has written in and says, um, I may see riders drinking from bidons that are surely spattered with all sorts of muck. Any thoughts? Uh, well, you see, before they actually do take a toot, they usually just give it a quick squirt, don't they, Magnus? Just to quick clear the nozzle for that very reason. Yeah, they, uh, that's what you tend to do. But um, a lot of the bottles today are designed in a way like um, so, so that you, yeah, they, they, they do clear themselves, actually. And... Uh, uh, I certainly always look down and kind of give the, the bottle a, clean, a quick wipe before you, you put it to your mouth. There we are. Or just um, uh, pump it a little bit. It looks like you're playing a water pistol fight, but it's not that. Uh, just clear the nozzle and then off you go. Um, I mentioned this actually in uh, um, farm debris and, and got harangued by a, a farmer's wife who really took exception, saying that it wasn't just farm vehicles. <laughs> that caused the mud. Well, no, but it is an agricultural area and any other vehicles can also uh, go a bit cross-country on occasion, even if it's just getting into ditches on minor roads to uh, help the overtaking process and drag on the muck therein. So, um, yeah, the roads do get dirty, although we've got a clean surface today. And the chance of rain is practically zero. High, very high cloud, as you can see, sort of flat light. But that's um, of no concern. What the major issue today is apart from uh, the automotive, which uh, thankfully has now just diminished because of the warnings that are there in. It's the wind. Mind you saying that, look at the, look at the clouds that uh, are, are awaiting. They may well burst, who knows? Um, it's hard to call weather in this part of the year. And this part of the world. Mm. You know, um, when I lived out here in Belgium and I had, uh, I had some of my friends and neighbours asking me where, where I've been on my training ride, I said, uh, look up in the sky, find the blue hole, and I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> Beveren, you can see that they have tombs rather than bury the dead. Uh, the reason is, if you bury them, they turn into leather, and because um, the water table is so high, um, basically it's almost like a burial at sea, I guess. Uh, so uh, yeah, above ground in um, in granite is the local habit. Yep. Well, there you are. There you, go. you get it all here. Oh, it's it's burial information as well. <laughs> 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 hey, it's going to come to all of us at some point. Hopefully not for quite a while. 64.4 uh, kilometres uh, remaining. Four and a half minutes then it is as they just uh, crest what is lo known locally as a bit of a mountain, uh, but is in fact a 10 metre rise. Um, the Ardennes does have its, um, its elevations. You have to look for them, uh, though, Magnus, and that explains why the routes have so many twists and turns and loops and switchbacks, because you've... You've got to search for those climbs, have you not, in this part of the world? Uh, certainly in the uh, in the parts of London, and then that you, you've got to you've got to look for the for the hills. And um, this this part of the world is is crazy flat. We were out there on the weekend, and uh, yeah, you can you're standing out in the middle of a field, and you can't see you can't even see uh, you can almost see the curvature of the earth, really. Um, but you can still, if you if you know where to go, you can still find some pretty good uh, good climbing to be done. You can. If you want to double your field of vision in this part of the world, just get two telephone directories and stand on them. <laughs> it's that, it really is. Um, big sky country, they call it. And it does have its own charm, doesn't it? I, I certainly think so. And uh, it's, it's certainly for bike racing, it's, uh, it's one of my favourite parts in the world to, uh, to, to go and race, certainly. Training... Mm. Uh, I could probably think of, of better places to go, but um, when it comes to racing, there's nothing quite like it. Um, and watch out for the Routier signs. Um, they extend beyond France into uh, Belgium as well. The Routier being the truck drivers. <coughs> truck drivers, they spend a lot of time on the road, and they know the best places to eat. And if you see a Routier sign at a scratchy old cafe, then it's good enough for me. You go in, it's usually a fixed menu. I went into one, um, got off a, a, a very sort of... Uh, I'd actually taken a mountain bike because the, the road was so absolutely disgusting in a place near Reis or Orti it was, Odi Valley. It wasn't much of a valley, but it came to this little tiny cafe and um, it just had a routier sign. It just said, um, uh, Dine. And I thought, well, why not? <laughs> I went in and it was, um, it was pigeon casserole. And um, I knew it was fresh because actually one of the pigeons had some lead shot in it. <laughs> 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 but you know what? Despite the lead shot, which went ding when it hit the um, it hit the tin plate out of my mouth, uh, it was absolutely delicious. And I remember it cost 
in, in, in English money, about three pounds, and it was just fantastic. That basket of bread, it was just the broth, basket of bread, and a flagon of wine. I was happy, boy. I bet you were. <laughs> <laughs> 62.4 kilometres to go, and uh, four minutes and 26. We're shooting the breeze, uh, hopefully keeping you entertained, because uh, today it's all going to be about the very last. It looks like um, the initial push is by Katusha. Oh, kind of being marked out by Astana, who have been read the riot act overnight. They will be doing a lot of work. Win or lose, they'll be doing a lot of work, Magnus, today. I think so. It's, uh, it's almost like they're on a bit of a punishing uh, kind of trip today where they, they all have to, uh, to do their the fair share of the work based on the um, poor performance yesterday. I mean, in, in, in a way, it was a great performance because they had two guys yeah. up there in, 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 in a group of three, but at the same time, yeah, you've got to take that one. Uh, if, you, if you're missing out on a win when you're that many riders, then, yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> Viktor Malikov, part of the Russian Gazprom team, They've sort of uh, come into our consciousness of late. Got big ambitions, and uh, they really do want to elevate themselves in your consciousness as well. Massive gas company, of course, with uh, pipelines all over the place. And um, good to see that even with the economic change as far as natural resources are concerned, that Gazprom uh, are maintaining a cycling team, which is good. I, I think they probably decided to go for the investment uh, before the price of gas tumbled, but so let's hope they stick around. 61.4 kilometres to go, 4 minutes and 19, and um, look at the pace that they're going, Magnus. They're not hanging about. Um, just describe to us, <clears throat> because there's a lot of cyclists who, who tune in, of course, but uh, they're at club level, um, how difficult it would be for them to keep up on what is just a roll as far as the pro peloton is concerned. Well, if we, we, all we need to really do is um, think of the average speed that these guys are going at, and... Um, Today, the, the, the pace has been relatively high uh, already from the start of the uh, of the race. We're looking at uh, well over 42 kilometers an hour, and, and that is it's fast, but it's not crazy fast. Um, I think the majority of, of club riders would find this um, incredibly hard to, to to sit in the wheels. It's it's, dif it's difficult to kind of give you an exact feeling of, of what it would be like, but. Uh, well, indeed, um, but you may be able to keep up for a kilometre or two, but 211, um, it's a big, big day, this. Two short stages tomorrow, we remind you. It's sprinting in the morning, 111.5, designed for the quick men, 111.5 uh, kilometres, so we're on early. Don't miss that. It's about 8.30 tomorrow morning. I'll have an exact start time for you in a short while. And uh, the individual time trial follows in the early afternoon in the UK. That's 15 kilometres, and that's where we'll find our winner. Right now, Christoph looks good for it. He went all in in the time trial, finished third on it when he took the title last year. Let's talk tree farming. <laughs> I'm, I'm, leaving, I'm leaving this to you, Carlton, because <laughs> it's not something that I'm overly familiar with, but I'm looking forward to learning. Uh, no, no. No, I was just joking. I, I, Magnus was kind of wondering how we were going to restart after the break. <laughs> I just decided to throw him a curveball. I'll tell you about poplar trees, if you like, and rotation farming, but uh, I, I, I learned all this while I was living in the locale. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's... Um, it's not that interesting, <laughs> quite frankly. It's an eight-year cycle for a poplar tree, and uh, they do knock them down and put them back up again. Uh, but there you go. And uh, a man's reputation is measured by his wood pile. And uh, uh, so I'm serious. If you let your wood pile go down too low, it's, um, it's frowned on locally. You're supposed to be out there cutting your blocks to set yourself up for winter. And about now, you're starting to think about uh, rebuilding it for next winter. Every day here, in this part of the world has a has a task to it if you're in the farming community um, whether that be I don't know slaughtering sheep potting up your gherkins you name it there's something to do on every single day of the year and if you're behind it's really frowned on um, the task of the day though for us is for the sprinters and we wonder who it is that's gonna get to the fore well there's plenty of favorites and we'll do, go through them in a few moments time um, 
an area of expertise that Magnus is far happier about <laughs> than talking about rotation farming of poplar trees. But, um, you know, to my mind, they're equally as important <laughs> on a day like this. Oh, cobbles and uh, the, the action therein. They're racing for position, and you see that uh, elevated section on the right-hand side. Well, that caused the accident, which has caused this. And yes, that's Jack Bauer in the ditch. And indeed, when anyone goes down and stays down, it's not a nice sight, I'm afraid. And uh, that's what we've got right now. And um, Magnus, you see the high crown in the middle of the road. It kind of forces you to the edge. And at the edge, you've got some elevated sections. Look at all the bidons that are collected there. That's where the accident started, and then it just reflects itself across the peloton doesn't it and uh, you get all kinds of problems yeah i mean they're all riding so close so that any 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 anyone going down it's always uh, you know they're likely to take a whole bunch of other people with yeah. them um, and it's unfortunate when it happens but on these particular stretch of cobblestones it's uh it's 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 a difficult one to uh, to get into because everyone wants to get up on that right hand side um uh, tarmac rivet uh, Jack Byer struggling to uh, to get across the uh, the ditch there and get back up onto his bike. But the Bardiani rider does not look at all happy. Let's have a look at it. You see the right hand side of the road. Now that's where the accident, to my mind, must have happened. Let's have a look at it. And it did. And there's the reflection across the pack. And then all of a sudden, it just concertinas to the other side of the road. So starts on the right where the elevated paving was. That was our guess. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, it was the Cofidis rider that tried to get up onto uh, to that tarmac bit and uh, completely messed up. And uh, Posato there down the back trying to hand over his uh, his raincoat, but <laughs> decided he had to stop for uh, for these crashed riders instead. Oh dear. Well, it's unfortunate when it happens, but like this, it's actually part of uh, of uh, the racing and. Um, crash is always going to happen it's never nice to see when people are hurt bad uh, no it's not and uh, it, our body only friend is uh, a case in point he's the one that suffered the most uh, there we are and this is that uh, as I say that reflection across the road and the body only rider just comes straight and gets poleaxed and finally goes down there he is and um, I'm afraid it's race over for him there's no way back and it looks like collarbone I'm afraid We've seen uh, it far too often, Magnus. Yeah, we certainly have. Hands are moving, so he's conscious. Yeah, that's good, but neck brace is going on, which is certainly not a... No, not a nice sight at all. No. Um, you've hit the deck several times yourself, Magnus. Um, how many collarbones have you got through? Uh, three, and um, an AC joint in my left shoulder as well, so... Do you still go beep in the, in the airport? <laughs> there's, there's certainly a, a fair amount of scaffolding being built in there, but... Uh, only when only when the security goes up do I beep going through the uh, the scanners. Um, apologies for the constant replays before we have a condition check on the injured rider, which I, I'm never very comfortable with, but uh, it's what we're being provided with by our uh, local broadcasters, I'm afraid. And um, just uh, trying to look to see uh, while we are here. Ouch. Well, he kind of rolled over and... Um, I think he hit his head quite yeah, hard there. Yeah, so do I. Um, the trouble is, if you go backwards... Um, you get a whiplash effect with your head, so let's hope he is OK. Um, it did not look nice at all, Magnus, and uh, benign looking crashes can actually be extraordinarily serious. Yeah, they can be, and it, it doesn't take an awful lot. If you land wrong, then, um, you know, it doesn't take an awful lot of, um, you know, what should we call it, force to, uh, to, to make it a bad impact. And uh, Well, let's just hope that we don't show any more of these pictures until we know, no. <coughs> one, who the rider is, uh, but two, more, more pertinently, of course, um, is, uh, is the condition of him health-wise. Don't want to see that again today. Uh, but we're not in control of the pictures. We'll do our best. Three minutes and 48, the gap now. And um, that will have caused... Um, all kinds of splits as well. Not that anyone will have been pushing on, but they, they were going at a fair old lick when we got to that pave section, weren't they? Yeah, and the crash happened relatively far back in the bunch yep. as well. So, um, you know, the guys on the on the front won't necessarily have known about the crash. And it's only when um, when the radio calls are coming through to um, for wheels and for uh, for other equipment that uh, the riders up near the front here will realise that there has been a crash. And if it's been a, a serious enough crash and potentially with someone. Um, you know, from the general classification, and they tend to uh, just 
hold back a bit and, and kind of wait for for the race to settle in. But looking at this sort of uh, setup today, 55 kilometers to go, and there's still three minutes and 47 down to uh, down to the peloton. The riders out front are doing a great job of, of holding the the peloton at bay. They certainly are. It's three minutes and 46, and I'm beginning to wonder whether Pim Lipdark can make it all the way today. He's in company, and uh, Bert Lerbacher is pretty handy, the boy from Top Sport Vladren. Um, we've seen him in breaks on a number of occasions this year, and he's always gone strongly. Well, he, he needs to go uh, keep that strength and demeanour today as we fly over the flatlands areas here. Now you see the old windmills there. Um, it's not for grinding, it's actually a water pump. Trying to keep the uh, land dry and put the water into one of the dikes, which have already been experienced by some of the riders. Big splits then, Magnus. Um, a little bit, I, I think, only due to the crash. Most notably, I think, the wind and the sudden exposure to it when you come out of villages and exit from woodland areas. Yeah, um, I don't know where you find the big woodland areas down on, on, on these well, you'll open see fields. You'll, you'll see a few. I haven't seen any today, I must admit, if you but count ge the, generally if you count speaking. These, <laughs> these trees down here as a woodland area, then yes. Um, but no, it, it's definitely uh, certain parts of the race will be uh, the crosswind that, that splits the race. But uh, at this point, I, I think it's still uh, the aftermath of, uh, of the crash that we've just had that's, uh, that's caused this. There we are, just uh, dipping down at Tinkoff and Cannondale. Um, with uh, personnel down here and worryingly as well for Lamprey who are reasonably short-handed they came to the race short-handed I'm hoping that's not for his sake Sasha Madolo who's back there Roberto Ferrari is his lead out man another quick guy who could be a feature but they've got to make up on a determined breakaway three minutes and 47 with 50 to go it's doable um, but 211 kilometers with a motivated escape that is frankly reasonably high quality particularly with Pim Lichtar on board um, it's a tall order it remains a tall order even this far out with uh, over 50 kilometers to go we're going to take ourselves a commercial break and when we come back uh, we'll take potentially some of your questions thank you so much for your company by the way if you'd like to join the conversation it's at Carlton Kirby all lowercase um, both my names and indeed Magnus Baxter, which is at Maggie PR, so M A G Y underscore PR. That's right, isn't it? That's correct. Yeah, and uh, we'll have a chat with you because I think there may well be, before we get to our circuit, uh, a little bit of time to do exactly that. We've got uh, 20 kilometres before we get to the circuit. We pass the start finish line for the first time. It'll be four times over the line, so fourth time is the finish. So three laps. I hope you understand. Uh, we'll talk you through it. Don't worry. So we're going to take that commercial break while uh, uh, Asadar load up on gels, um, take some drink, and indeed a bit of advice, and the advice is you'd better win. I don't know what that is in uh, Kazakhstani, but I might look it up in the break. See you in a moment. Welcome back. That's a gorgeous shot on a brightening day at the moment. It's had its bumps and bruises. More than that, we've uh, got an injury to one of our friends from uh, Bardiani, and we're wishing well. Uh, no condition check just yet um, upon him, or indeed name check just for the time being. There, beautiful blue skies, and the sun just uh, starting to think about breaking through. Um, Lars Bohm looks like he's taking it easy today. Not quite sure why. Um, maybe it's just that he doesn't have to impose himself just yet, and he's not worried about the pace, but uh, he's, he was off the back a few moments ago. Uh, Van Ginneken. I've seen more of Van Ginneken this year than I have for uh, quite some time. He's no, uh, he's no youngster anymore, but still pretty handy and has found himself a good team within Rumpot. And indeed, as you can see, the flatlands here where they've, uh, they've sprinkled some lime by the looks of things. Yeah, crosswind causing a bit of, uh, bit of issues for a few riders down the back there now. Well, we're just waiting to reassemble ourselves as, uh, <coughs> as a fighting force, as well as are the peloton, as you can see, and that is uh, Kuznetsov that just rolls into the back of this quartet, uh, in quintet, in fact. You can see the way they're uh, echeloned across the road, protecting themselves as best as they can from what is now a cross headwind as uh, they make a turn. Um, this road quite sinuous, but they're uh, heading more northerly 
and so as a result they're heading um, sort of northwest at the moment but it's a westerly breeze and so as a result that's uh, why you can see it's a cross headwind as we stand they'll have all directions of course when we're on the circuit just passing the freshly limed fields here uh, preparing themselves for uh, uh, winter wheat, presumably, be a long growth season for those bare fields. And right now, this man has uh, got a bare-faced task, I'm afraid, to try and get back in. So many have had to suffer. This is Oli Le Gac. You saw, uh, we saw a few moments ago that Lars Bohm suffering off the back. I don't think it's going to be his day, and he didn't look overly motivated to try and fight back in. These guys are the problem. Pim Lipdar in particular, who's only 46 seconds down at the top of the day. Our friend from Rome Pot, 3 minutes and 32. Van Lerbeke also, the same time deficit as uh, Lichtart. So they're both joint leaders on the day because they, for the time being anyway, virtual leaders. They've got 3 minutes and 25. They're, they've been holding over 3 minutes for quite some time, Magnus. Yeah, they certainly, they certainly have. Uh, they're doing a great job out there. And uh, as, as we got some of these issues going on in, in, in the back of the bunch with uh, a few crashes and so on, it, uh, it tends to slow down the bunch. And that just means that it plays right into the hands of, um, of the breakaway. Uh, although with whatever wind directions and uh, you know issues that we're going to have over the next uh, number of kilometers, uh, there's still an awful lot of road to be done, uh, to be ridden. and, and I think it's going to be difficult for them up in the front there, certainly another 50, 50 kilometers to go, which means, um, yeah, it's, it's still very much doable for the bunch. Uh, about 60 riders here, <coughs> to my rudimentary um, counting, like a wrangler on a cattle ranch, I'm giving it a guess. Um, but yeah, it's probably, probably nearer 70, but nonetheless, off the back you've got uh, several small groups who are fighting to get back in. Oh, just uh, having a tweet here from uh, from Bardiani, and uh, they're saying that uh, uh, Nicola Bohem, who who crashed, is is um, has had a, has he, he hit his face on on the ground, and um, he's conscious. Uh, they put a neck collar on him for precautions and taking him to hospitals for uh, for checkups. But um, first checks is that nothing is too bad. Not sure. too serious, um, certainly not life-threatening, which is what we worry about, of course, in these uh, these dark days when, of course, we've lost a couple of riders recently. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's always a shock. Um, Dan Jungier and the, uh, of Roubaix, Lille Metropole in the Criterium International, um, it was a cardiac arrest, actually, uh, for him, so it was more physiological. But uh, Antoine de Moitier wanted Group Gobert of of course, uh, cruelly uh, killed by one of the on-site motorcycles. An accident, sure enough, but the motorcycle, I'm afraid, dealt the fatal blow, and uh, that was on the Ghent Bevelgum, just 25 years of age, and uh, just don't want that to be lost to us in terms of our thoughts. And we, we've had... Uh, he remains with us, doesn't he? Um, all, well, all, the, all the riders who've suffered, of course, uh, but those who lose their life while doing something that they enjoy, Magnus. Um, it's almost added to the poignancy and, uh, uh, and the upset. It, it's, it's a big loss and, and a, tra a tragic loss at that. And, you know, uh, we've, we've had a, a number of these happening over the last, uh, last few years. And um, one of the more sort of horrible ones that, that, that I witnessed was uh, a reasonably close friend in uh, World of Ailan. Um, and since then, there's been there's been more of them, and I, I certainly hope that something will be done in terms of the security for the riders, um, not just the motorbikes and the cars that are, are in and around the peloton, but also the race routes, the uh, traffic furnitures that, that that is out there, and um, uh, you know they, they cause a major problem for the riders as well. And mm. certainly, this part of the world, if uh, we just look around what they're riding through right here now. Um, there's enough hazards um, th for the riders to deal with anyway. Mm. So we don't it need to add any, any more complications. And I think the core, certain of the, some of the more dangerous corners need to be signposted far better than what mm. they are. And, uh, uh, you know, given, given the riders a heads up that something's coming on. And oh. this whole thing, taking the race radio away from the riders in certain races, I find that, uh, and I have found it all the way through this whole conversation that we've had completely 
Well, they've scratched that now. It's uh, it's back largely in just about all races. In fact, uh, e even some of the lower level races, mm. they've decided to allow it. Um, technology <clears throat> has moved on. It's uh, it, it's become cheaper, and uh, some of the smaller teams. It was always an economic argument to trying to level the playing field further down the order. It's gone because you can pick up a decent radio these days, and you're talking, you know, 20, 30 euros, and and you'll be okay per rider. I'm talking. Just uh, back to uh, Brian Cookson, who said that this is a priority, uh, security. And indeed, uh, uh, he's tweeted today to say that it's in hand and uh, will be looked at. Uh, of course, um, it's the protocols that need to be set. Uh, licenses for um, uh, vehicles involved. 60 motorcycles, by the way, some of you are asking. 62, I think it was, on Gent Bevelgem. That's a lot of motorcycles. And one of them, of course, dealt a fatal blow. 62 kilometres to go. Three minutes and eight is the gap. And <laughs> there you go. Why don't you just watch it, guys? It does beat me that people would prefer to watch uh, live television as they go by, <laughs> essentially, <laughs> uh, rather than actually just watch them go by. Uh, you can always do that from, uh, from the television these days. I mean, it, it beats me, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it does, but I, I also find that I'm not, I'm not a big photographer as such. I, I prefer to watch the thing rather than to stand there and staring through my, uh, you know, my camera or phone or whatever. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's an it. interesting one. Yeah, um, Ian from Cycling Medic, he uh, goes to Flanders each year. Um, I think he's actually skipping it this year because uh, it's actually difficult to get over to Flanders. I'll be flying over on um, Friday, by the way. Uh, those of you who fancy coming to say hello, please do so. Uh, you'll have to hold a sign up as to where you are opposite the commentary position. But do realise that once the race is live, so are we. And we're not going to put the mics down and come over and say hello at that point. So um, we'll do our best to give you a wave, etc. if you do come and say hello. Or indeed, if it's before we go on air, you never know. We, we might pop out and... Um, uh, Sean Kelly does a good signed hat. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes, uh, Tour of Flanders this coming weekend, and yes, uh, in answer to some of your questions, I will be in Bruges, uh, where the press centre is, and a lot of the teams stay close by. And uh, I'll be there from Thursday. So um, if anyone fancies um, a fruit juice or anything uh, slightly stronger, <laughs> you know, like an well, apple, apple juice. Apple. <laughs> <laughs> That's <it. laughs> <laughs> then uh, then be, please feel free to come and say hello. Um, you know, I hate an empty glass as much as the next man. Um, glass half full, glass half empty. Um, big question for Andre Greipel, back from injury, uh, injury and illness. How will he go today? Well, that's a very good question, I think. Um, I, 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 I don't actually know how, how good he is at this I particular I don't know whether moment. he does at the moment. No, that, that could be one issue as well. Mm. And this is a great test bed, isn't it, this race, uh, to find out just how, you, how you're doing. It, it certainly is. And it, it's always been a good final outing before Tour of Flanders if you're, um, if you're feeling that you're not quite on top of your game, then you come here and you do these three days of racing and uh, then you have a, a couple of days off and usually your legs sort of come around then for, for the Sunday. I hope that photographer who's standing in the field is going to compensate the farmer for the sugar beet he's treading on. Well, we'll have to write to him and ask. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Sugar beet, by the way, mashes up and uh, they pulp it. There's several production houses around here, one in the place called Edin, as well, over to, well, way over the French border, actually. Um, and they mash it up. Oh, dear. And it, there's a mashed elbow as well. Mm. Van Bilsen with a second-hand elbow, as you can see. Anyway, they produce something called Eau de Vie, Water of Life. And in Old Scots, that's Ischi Baja, Ischi. 41.7 kilometres to go. Time to uh, drop in for a chat. This looks um, like a, a neutral vehicle. Not quite sure what's going that on. That would be the uh, race doctor having a bit yeah. of a uh, cleaning up session on, uh, yeah. on the elbow there. There we are. Um, I've seen actually riders go back with um, what they claim are insect bites so they can hold on to the car. That stung a bit, didn't it? Um, and um, I've actually also seen riders nip themselves and then go back and ask for uh, a little bit of cream from the doctor. Ever done that? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's not a place where I like to hang out. To be fair. <laughs> That's where we're heading. The coast beckons, and indeed our um, circuit today. Let's talk you through it. It's 11.2 kilometres in length. We take it three times, so we'll be there when the little ticker on your screen says 33.6. I hope you've done your maths. Um, and Magnus, let's talk about it. Several turns, and some of them are more focused than others. They certainly are. It's a uh, it's a tricky old circuit that they're doing. Um, it's always been a bit of a a funny one to to ride, to be honest with you. Um, but but I think you know that there's. There's an awful lot of crosswind that can be, uh, be coming in on, on this particular section as well as we're going uh, right along the seafront in, uh, in, in Coxeda. Um, but the circuit itself, yes, a couple of torter turns, but nothing too bad. It's more road furniture, uh, some tram lines and all that sort of stuff that the riders are going to have to deal with. Um, Marco says, what about a shout for the one pro guys? Well, we've got three Brits, including uh, Chris Opie, who can go quickly. Um, so, yeah, why not, Chris? He's got Matt Harley-Goss <laughs> to lead him out, or will it be the other way around? Uh, Josh Hunt and Christian uh, Huser. In fact, uh, in fact, I think Opie's... Is he scratched from the race now? Yeah. Josh Hunt, likewise. Um, so, apologies for that. They're not going to feature. So, um, Matt, Matt just... Goss, jo uh, Josh Hunt and um, Chris Opie are out, and the same thing for Steele van Hoff. So, so, I think they had a... Excuse quite me, can, I just, can yeah. I just rewind the tape? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we've got a, a note in here from Marco, wants us to mention One Pro Cycling. Yeah. Uh, well, unfortunately for them, Chris Opie, uh, Josh Hunt and Matt Goss <laughs> <laughs> are out of this one. Uh, so, all uh, Brit interest lies upon Christian House. Go for it, mate. Well, Christian House is definitely one of the guys and, um, who's a, a very strong rider in... Um, and has been for, for some time taking a step up to this level but I think uh, the team's main focus is going to be to get Miles and Bielablocki back into uh, uh, into tomorrow's uh, tomorrow afternoon stage in as good a condition as they can get him uh, for Miles and then to do a number in the uh, in the time trial they've lost von Hoff as well yeah. what's going on there might be sickness actually through the team um, there's a lot of crashes yesterday yeah, though as well too, so. yeah. but uh, they lost four so that's a bit of an ouch I'm afraid for one pro cycling. Um, Christian House, though, he's, um, he's, a, he's a proper tough guy, isn't he? I've um, seen him in the milk race um, as well as uh, a number of others. 36 years of age now. You wouldn't argue, would you? <laughs> I've had a few arguments with him on the bike, oh, actually, when, yeah, when, I was <laughs> when I was racing on the UK scene here. Uh, no, he's a great guy and uh, a, a very, very good bike rider indeed. He's got the nose for, uh, for how to... Uh, how to ride around in the uh, in, in the bunch, there's no doubt about that. And uh, one a very all round type of rider as well. Uh, the Belgian Air Force, most of it just uh, flying by, as you can see. Uh, security at uh, at its highest in Belgium, as I'm sure you can appreciate. And in fact, with the 100th Flanders as well, I imagine it's going to be absolutely at its very highest. So. Apparently, don't turn up with a backpack, by the way, uh, when you go to Flanders this weekend, because you won't be allowed to carry it into uh, the zone of the course. Well, that's a good thing, but um, the riders are just now getting on to the, uh, the back end of, of the circuit, so uh, this is what we will be dealing with later on. Indeed. Um, so, once we cross the line, for the first time of asking, that will be at 33.6 kilometres to go, so in about 5 k's time. Um, so, we come in to the circuit uh, from the south, essentially. We'll head up towards the coast. When we go to Coxider Bad, um, we'll take a right-hander to Coxider Good. <laughs> no, that doesn't exist. I'm, I made that up. Uh, <laughs> but we'll we'll drift along um, to uh, uh, Osterkirke, the small church. The um, uh, that will be the eastern church. Then we'll take a uh, a right hander, and that's almost arrow straight down Leopold the second lane. That's Leopold the second lane uh, to the finish line. Do you like my translations? Fantastic, Carl. Yep. By the way, that's battery powered. Uh, don't worry too much about it. Um, it, it it's for show. 
uh, these days. And in fact, each year we come by, that windmill has been looking smarter and smarter. And this time by, it frankly looks like it's made of Lego. So shiny and new. It might be. But it, <laughs> well, what, a, what a handsome display of Lego as part of the world. <laughs> Rear puncture, not what you want. Luke Rowe got bitten by one of these late on yesterday. and It, was a, it, it took a huge chunk out of his aspirations for the race, didn't it? Yeah, well, it certainly did. Um, I think Luke would have been uh, been a, a major player in the final yesterday, and uh, it was very unfortunate to see him uh, have that puncture. Uh, although he did very well in, in getting back on and, and keeping somewhat of a, a gap on the, on the rest of the peloton by the time they got to the finish, although got distant by about 39 seconds or so mm. to uh, to Christoph and the two Astana riders. 2.10, says the board, 2.13, 11, pick, take your pick, there or thereabouts. Oh, here's our favourite bar that looks like an ocean liner. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not much more to say, really. We'll be seeing this one tomorrow <laughs> again in the time trial. i tell you what, if you fancy a knack verse on the left, that's your place. There we are. You're right, and Andre. Um, I'm not sure whether it's Andre or Andre Greipel. Who's your pick today as we as we head in? Are they going to get caught? Looks like it. And if so, who's your pick? I think my pick for today is going to be uh, Elia Viviani. Really? Well, it'd be great to see because he's, he's, the little sides of his mouth have been turning down of late ever since he uh, thought he got mugged with the help of Mark Cavendish. <laughs> <laughs> um, during the uh, Omnium Track Worlds, Eli Viviani was not happy. Um, and uh, well, we'll see whether he's managed to pick himself up. He, he, the, the luster has been off him since then. He, he was uh, quite bright at the top of the year, went well in Dubai, etc. It would be nice if he went well again today. All we can do is wait and see. He's 14 minutes down, however, and Danny Van Poppel, who can also go quickly, is only a minute and three down. I don't know whether that has any impact today. Van Poppel, I think, a minute and three down on Christoph. He's not going to make that kind of ground up. Um, this beach side, as you can see, in Belgium, and uh, there's plenty of dunes here. Just don't go out at dusk on a warm summer night uh, if you don't like blushing. I'm moving on. Uh, 35.8 kilometres to go, and uh, two minutes and five. Magnus, stop smiling. Uh, <laughs> yes, motocrossers, you've got to be careful of them. <laughs> and other activities. <laughs> two minutes and five. There's a lot of bushes here. Yeah, there are. So, uh, rabbit hunting. Anyway, <laughs> we're on our circuit, Max. I'm, I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to stay, stick to the bars tonight uh, and hope, of course, and there, there's our Ocean Liner bar again. We'll be mentioning it once more. I haven't got a name on it yet. Um, I'm not, it'll probably be named after some famous admiral who went on skirmishes over, the, <laughs> over in the UK, I'm sure, like a Ranji boom or something like that. A, I know that's the wrong country. Oh, it said Normandy, I think. That was a big liner. Three up the road, 35.1 kilometres to go. We're on our finishing circuit. Two minutes and 13 is the gap. We had an eight-man breakaway at the top of the day. And, well, due to the wind and, indeed, some sterling climbs today, we had some Hellingen, indeed, uh, some of the biggest and most testy out there, but they really didn't have that much of an impact because they were dealt with and all finished with about 90 kilometres to go. As you can see, we're on the circuit that will finish and we'll be crossing the finish line in for the first time in a very short while, in fact, in a kilometre's time. A little bit less than that right now. Um, there are rush points up for grabs. I'm not sure how bothered these guys will be by that. Um, and indeed, as the sun comes out, we've got ourselves a bit of a heat haze going on, as you can see. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, well, they are bothered about it. And, of course, it's our friend from Rumpot who wants the lion's share. So, Zlik... I, I think Lichter is the one who's going to be the most keen on this one, and only 46 seconds, uh, he's in 10th place overall, so a couple of seconds bonus here would, um, would set him up, up in a right nice place. Three, two and one seconds bonuses for the rushes, of which we've got three each time across uh, the finish line before the last time of asking. And here we are, uh, uh, that's Slick looking uh, very conscious that Lichter is on his case. 
Lerbecker as well for Top Sport Vlaanderen. There's no slouch and he goes first, peeks out and he may well have mugged all of them now. Lerbecker is strong, he's shown that over the last couple of uh, stages he's been racing. And he holds the strength, but is it enough to beat Lichtock? Yes, it is. Three seconds bonus to uh, Van Lerbecker. And our Bertie now trims himself down to 43 seconds off the leader. And that was a tidy piece of work from our man from Top Sport Vladrum. It certainly was. And uh, like I said, he's on 46 seconds as well uh, in the general classification. So um, he's, uh, he's moved himself up nicely there. 33.7 kilometers to go and look how focused it is coming into that turn when they take the bell that will be at full chat because there'll only be 11 k's to go let's not forget there's your bonuses Van Lerbeke, Lichter and Zilk or Zlik I beg your pardon well when he hit the front there was no catching him and I'm wondering whether that's a wake-up call for Pim Lichter as to the capabilities of uh, of Bertie here well, you certainly got to keep an eye on him, and uh, I thought Lichtat would have uh, would have tried to anticipate that sprint a bit more than he did. He waited for too long, really. Um, Lichtat is someone who prefers a, a faster run into a, to, to a finish than, than what that was. So, um, but you got to you got to take your hat off to uh, Van Leeuwenberger there, who um, clearly got you know a, a good good result in that sprint and moved him up to seventh overall. He's a handy sprinter. Um, <clears throat> I watched him at the Ruta del Sol, finished second behind D Danny Bernati on a day where there was a few elbows out there um, on stage, the opening stage, in fact, beat Gatto, beat Lobato, uh, Buani, indeed, as well, who hadn't given the break enough respect. So he can sprint quickly, Van Lerbeke, and he sort of showed that from a reduced group um, without the real cream of the crop sprinter-wise. He can go well. We've seen it this year already. Yeah, we certainly have, but uh, you know, if you're looking at, uh, at at that particular result you're talking about, there's still Nazabani in 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 the field there in the, in the mix of things. Um, although clearly didn't get it quite right. Um, yeah, he's, he's certainly not slouching in a sprint. Certainly not. So 32.7 k's remaining. I'm going to go for Sasha Modulo today. Uh, I can see that the Lamprey boys have got four of their number. Roberto Ferrari, I'm hoping, is also there. Um, he's not a cobbles man, but then again today is not really a cobbles day the cobbles that we have had have been rather well manicured and not very long No, they're not not particularly long on this on this stage. Yeah, it, it's more the, the the open areas that they go through mm. the crosswinds that has set this um, This particular stage apart in 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 the past. So um, yeah, it's it's certainly uh, just a, a long day and uh, effectively designed to be uh, a, a good sort of a, a good little tester for what's about to come on Sunday and then give the guys a, f a final sort of big nice outing on on the bike before they start recovering a bit towards uh, towards Tour of Flanders so we're going to take ourselves a commercial break with 32.1 uh, K's remaining for those up the road those further back clearly suffering as you can see it's been a windy old day today Welcome back, just over 30 k's remaining, and they're starting to argue about work rate. We've seen this before, Magnus. <laughs> Deja vu. Yes, exactly. Yesterday, in case you missed it, Liu Vestra and Andrei Alexei, I beg your pardon, Lutschenko of Astana were in the break. Unfortunately, them, so was uh, Alexander Krisov in the remaining trio. And um, things not good. I think this is the armed forces actually displaying their presence to um, the assembled, quite frankly. And there may well be a few military buzz buzzings over Flanders as well, just to reassure the crowd as much as anything else. And uh, I don't want to wish any kind of incident on anybody, but um, show of strength is clearly part of the order of the day. After the faux pas of yesterday, with uh, Lutschenko and Vestra tangling within their own team, essentially, arguing towards the last, 
Aston have put in a decent amount of effort. They've also mixed it with Katusha, who we believe will be a man down at the end of the day after a lashing out incident a little bit earlier on. Good to see BMC as well, just uh, possibly thinking about engaging with a long one. They've come here with a very fine time trialing team, BMC. And so they've got the ability to go long. It's whether they'll be allowed to do so with um, Katusha wanting to protect Chrisov and Astana desperate to make amends for their mess up yesterday. Well, I think Astana are in, in a good position to potentially take the um, the overall here with um, with Liu Vestra, but uh, you know it's the, the rest of the guys are now effectively fighting for um, sort of lower positions really because. Uh, with, with a 46 second down to uh, down to the bunch, it's going to be a very tall order to get themselves back uh, any for anyone to get themselves back up into real contention. Even if we're talking someone like Tony Martin, uh, it's the time trial is too short to to make that kind of a time gap up again. Um, shame we're not hearing the interviews going on at the moment. So it's only with team cars, not with riders. You understand, um, which is uh, um, a shame. Ryan A just uh, getting some. Uh, vital information from Lotto Sudal, presumably, as to what they're going to be planning for um, Andre Greipel, as if he probably, as if he was going to let them know. Lickdart decides to go uh, for a little bit of a kick here. Yeah, he spotted a, a nice little move there on the inside in that corner, and actually we used the bike path and um, distanced uh, our, um, our uh, Sli Ivan Slick there from uh, from Rompot and uh, decided to go on his own, and uh, he's also distanced. Uh, Leerbergen now, so uh, Lichtag clearly feeling the strongest has now decided that okay, I'm taking this on myself. I think, frankly, after he got mugged for those three seconds, he'd like uh, the, the, the next three all to himself. Thank you very much at the line when he crosses on his own. If he does manage to hold out for that long, and can he go all the way? Well, he's 27 years of age, he's, um, he's very close to the top of his game at the moment. He's looking very handy. Um, yeah, why not? For goodness sake, he was um, at the top of the day, uh, top of the year, I beg your pardon, top of the season. He was fourth in the Cadell Evans race, and that's early form. And clearly, he's come out of uh, the warmer climbs and carried it into the cl colder climbs as well. And he's on his game, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's a quality bike rider, you know. It, um, it certainly is. Uh, I'm not surprised to see him up here, and not surprised to see him being the strongest in this, uh, in this trio either. I was a bit surprised that he actually got himself uh, jumped by uh, Van Lieberg in, in, in that intermediate sprint. But um, he's now decided that, OK, I want the next three seconds. And uh, with that moving well up into um, into the top um, five, six overall. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's doing a good ride here. I'm hearing that uh, Modolo was a non-starter this morning. I haven't got confirmation of it, but... Um Ian from Cycling Belling has, has actually uh, written in and said that, uh, yes, um, was a DNS this morning. Usually reliable, is Ian. 27.7Ks uh, remaining, so that being the case, Lamprey presumably working for Ferrari today. We'll wait and see. Um, it's a modest gap now, and I think this is possibly last roll of the dice for uh, Pim Lichter. Well, he's still got a minute and 38 seconds, but with 27.5 kilometers to go, that's uh, it's going to be a tall order, and certainly as a, as a lone rider. Uh, had, his, had his three uh, breakaway mates in there, should we call them, um, been able to uh, to work with them and work harder with them, then they may have had a bit of a, a chance, but the two many teams up in the front now of the bunch uh, willing to ride as well, so I think for it's going to be a... A tall order for Pim Lechta to uh, to hold on to this. He he will definitely pick up the next couple of bonus seconds, but after that, I wonder how much more he's going to be able to do. Indeed, he's only got 15 seconds on the uh, two riders remnant from the breakaway. There were eight at the top of the day. This man, though, just uh, hugging the um, alongside the road, alongside the railway tracks. Was it only a one in 32 a train can take? So it's pretty flat. Um, as they pass by the um, Hotel Normandy, the former Hotel Normandy, as Retsky has, uh, has sent me a, a, a picture of it. Um, still reasonably she-she, but um, Hoosie Madness says um, a half-sunken liner. <laughs> Sounds a bit <laughs> James Bondy, doesn't it? Uh, yes, <laughs> sort of thing he would, uh, he would um, break into. Why not? 26.1 Ks 
to go then and we've got a hiatus for the time being this is going to get lively magnus um have you picked your man today i have i uh, put viviani down i'm going to go for greipel then uh, because they look reasonably lively our friends from lotto sudal and in fact they've not had to do too much of the chasing that's uh, been engaged by katusha and of course astana who are on the punishment block at the moment you can see alexander Kristoff. That's looking um, reasonably aero. Yesterday looked reasonably uncomfortable, I'm afraid, at the end of what was a very busy day. He said he really didn't fancy it before he got onto the uh, big loops of yesterday. Much small, smaller loop. We're on that right now. In fact, we'll be uh, crossing the start-finish line fairly shortly. And, uh, and you know, I'll get an exact shuffle, shuffle. There we are in three k's time. A little bit less than that. We'll be over the uh, finish line once more. We've got quite a hiatus, Magnus. I can't really see any out-and-out -out attacking before we get to um, the the bell for the last time of Aski. I'm, I'm just wondering if they're going to take back Lichtart and there's going to be a solid push to get to him before they knock it back. Yeah, definitely. Flat tie here for uh, Marseille Bodna. But I think you're right in, in terms of uh, at outright attacking. This particular circuit doesn't lend itself for... Uh, individual attacks is so flat and, uh, and and exposed that it's it's very difficult for for a lone rider or even a smaller group to get any kind of um, any kind of gap on the peloton so if anything is likely to happen it would be uh, if there was enough wind about to, um, to to split this this bunch up in, in in the crosswind but it doesn't look like this particular section of road is uh, is exposed enough and certainly the, the wind may be coming from the wrong direction for it to uh, to really cause any damage got quite high embankments here as well as you can see um, looks like the road has been seated in um, it may well have been that they uh, embanked for the protection of the railway line why not so there's your uh, flam rouge although you can't see the flam there it is uh, horizontal as a wind sock but it's a tailwind at uh, this point by the looks of things as uh, um, they about to make the cut or at least it was being displayed that way by the uh, it's actually a cross tailwind, incidentally. Again, we're missing out on the interview at, uh, with the Sky Central, as you can see, but they'll be asking, I imagine, about Viviani and his prospects for today. He is a prospect. And I think Danny Van Poppel might... It would be more use for him to, to get up there, but Viviani is clearly the quicker of the two men. 23.1Ks uh, remaining then, and we've got two more laps, Magnus. Um, it looks like it's pattern held for the time being, and I think it may well be for about the next eight or, or ten k's. Yeah, I, I uh, got to agree with you there, Carlton. It's uh, it's not likely that we're going to see anyone attacking out of the peloton. The, uh, there's a number of teams up on the front there now, and, and the pace is is driven up high. So it's it's more of a question of uh, is this bunch going to split or is it going to stay all together? And uh, the, the riders out front here, Pim Lichtau, coming across the line just uh, in, in a few minutes' time to pick up the three seconds. After that, I, uh, I wonder whether he's going to continue to drive this and, uh, and try and stay out there. Well, he's going to try um, because he's got nothing else to do. Well, you've got nothing no, else to do, really, although yeah. um, he, he does have a stage in t tomorrow morning and it's, uh, it's usually a very hard-fought stage. Um, it, we're on the same kind of road as we have been uh, th this afternoon certainly in the last 50 60 kilometers and it's a hundred kilometer stage um, and when you've got those short stages it, they tend to be super fast and uh, and really hardly fought as well you can't let any group get away for and certainly not get any any bigger time gaps um, there's just not enough road to to bring them back on then and they don't tire out there after 100 kilometers either so they can do the sort of high level of, uh, of pace and power output that, that's requi required for, for such a short period of time. So, and then obviously there's a time trial in the afternoon. So uh, I, if I was Pim Lichtard in this position, I, I would uh, start contemplating um, backing off and, uh, and saving my legs for tomorrow because now he's clearly moved himself up in the, um, in the general classification and uh, got himself... Work that out quickly. Um, 
tomorrow morning, don't forget, we will be on air at 9.30 UK time, so it's 10.30 Central European time. Um, it's an early start because it's uh, a double phase day. We have the uh, uh, stage for the quick men, but it's short, sharp and uh, sweet for somebody, 111.5 kilometres. And then we have a break and then we start the individual time trial to decide our winner. And it may well come down to the time trial, Magnus. I think it will be good coming down to the time trial and unless we wake up tomorrow morning and uh, we've got 40, 50 mile an hour winds, at which point it may be a, a different scenario. But this is, uh, is certainly in the past has come down to, to the final time trial to decide the, uh, the, the overall winner. Although obviously with uh, yesterday's uh, results, having three guys on, on uh, just about 40 seconds on, on the rest of the bunch, there's not an awful lot of other riders who've got uh, the potential of uh, of getting back into the mix of, uh, of the podium. So uh, I, th I think we we're talking about Pim Lichtal. He's currently lying sixth now after his uh, intermediate uh, sprint seconds. And he would do well to uh, ease up and uh, start thinking about tomorrow and tomorrow's time trial and uh, uh, you know try and defend that, that sixth place. Well, there's not a great deal of advice coming his way from the team car at the moment. Um, I think they're going to leave it up to him as to what his choice is, but it may well be that that's the way things pan out. Um, how committed do you think he looks at this stage in a very long day? Well, it's certainly looking like he's still pressing on and, and, and giving it what he's, uh, what he's got left in the tank. So uh, it's clearly not got it in his head that he's going to back off and save anything. Mm. Marcel Kittel started off as the day's out-and-out favourite. He's got some pretty handy lead-out men as well. Fabio Sabatini, we saw him in trouble a little bit earlier on. Um, Maximiliano Ricciesi. Ilio Kaiser as well sets a good temper when he needs to. The great six-day man, one of my favourite riders, uh, Ilio. Um, but, yeah, what about Marcel Kittel? We haven't really spoken about him today. No, we haven't. Uh, but looking at uh, what's happening in the front of the bunch here, Ethics up there contrib contributing to, to the chase. I think Marcel must be uh, must be feeling reasonably good and uh, willing to give it a go for the sprint. He and had a shocking season last year, didn't he? Um, just didn't get his head round it. I don't think it was anything to do with his head, to be honest. He well, wanted to race, but he uh, he he was uh, he was sick in the beginning of the year and um, thought he'd recovered from it. Got back into racing, fell back into the same trap again, and that effectively s destroyed his whole uh, season and. Um, I think it's he's, he's going to take him some time to get back up to the same level again, although we've seen him clearly do well in the beginning of the year, um, you know, picking up stage wins uh, in, in Dubai and so on. But I, I have a feeling that um, he's not quite at 100% yet, and uh, it will take him some time. It was that nastier virus that he had. Mm. You've suffered a virus yourself, which knocked you out. Yeah, I did. Uh, and long term, wasn't it? Long term and a re re mm. relatively similar type of... Uh, thing to what clearly Marcel had where any, any time I tried to train properly uh, I just fell back into it again and got, got sick again so mm. uh, that effectively ruined my um, thoughts of, of giving you know, the Ironman triathlon a, a proper go last year Well you find yourself a nice little uh, um, um, niche within the cycling world with your training so yeah. it's going well? Yeah, no, it, it's, it's going really well and uh, I started up a coaching company and um, and working with uh, riders all over all over Europe now so uh, it's something that I really do enjoy and uh, and the, the best part is looking after the um, the, the youngsters that we got in uh, in our team Zlik has been absorbed two men remain up the road it's Van Leverge and this man Pim Lichtart who is a lonely figure at the moment and it looks like a hiding to nothing on some of these uh, very very straight sections be well within sight of the peloton minute and 16 it's controllable so it looks like yet again like we had in 2011 12 13 and indeed last year 15 we're going to have a big bunch sprint hold on to your hats magnus this is going to be exciting we've got 18.5 kilometers to go normally on um, a standard stage race day they'd be pit pitching up to uh, a proper approach speed at the moment they've got a man up the road a minute and 15 clear i don't think they need to worry too much about catching him i think they will and i don't think it's really going to get animated until possibly 
um, they hear the bell. On the approach to the Flamme Rouge for the penultimate time, I think that's when we're going to start racing this. I think that's when the, the, the pace will really be driven up here. We've got Swain Tuft on the front now for, for Orica Greenwich, and uh, he's, they're all setting, setting something up for, for Luca Meskic. And, um, yeah, I, I, I have that feeling of a big bunch sprint coming on. And, I just wonder how, how Christoph uh, yeah. is going in, in I with the sprinting. He's, he certainly had a good kick on him yesterday, although not really Very against reduced, the fastest, not yeah. really against the fastest sprinters in the world. But um, a bit of motivation and uh, uh, a sort of a pat on the back for himself yesterday with that win. So I, I, I think he'll certainly be a a major contender in today's sprint. I guess we'll find out if it's job well done for him. He has been ill. Don't forget that he took a stage win yesterday, defended his title with honour. He wears the leader's jersey, but we'll see whether he can remuster himself today. If you look through or further down this line, you will see Sky, and they've done a clever job of just keeping Viviani's powder dry for what will be a confidence booster, I think, for Elia. Yeah, I think he uh, is at that point now where he's... he's I wouldn't say desperate for a win, but he's, he's getting towards that point. Mm. He's uh, certainly hungry for one, isn't he? Yeah, very much so. He, he's um, had some good good results in the beginning of the year, but not great. And that's that's one of the issues as well with doing so much track work as, as he's been doing, because he's clearly got his eyes set on the Olympic Omnium title. Um, but with that, you tend to lose a certain amount of, uh, of road legs. Uh, when, when you're doing that amount of track work, so the World Championships doesn't for, for the track doesn't come in the ideal position for for any of the road riders. Uh, looming large, as you can see, Etics in front of them is Bora, and then Orica Greenedge with Mezgets. Um, not quite sure where the um, uh, Scott Thwaites is in the house, by the way, for Bora Aragon. Um, Andreas Schillinger as well, reasonably quick. Jan Barter can do a good lead out when he needs to. 17 k's remaining, though. Um, it's you naturally your eyes now are drawn to Kaiser, Greipel, Viviani, Christoph, um, maybe Gardini, potentially Sonny Colbrelli and uh, Nicola Ruffoni, um, who will have got themselves. Colbrelli had a decent finish in the Milan San Remo, so he's possibly. Um, thinking about trying to make amends for the fact that he, amongst so many other top sprinters, actually got it wrong. Well, Buoni, of course, uh, dropped himself a chain. Uh, it, it, that was really shoulders down for him, I'm afraid. Uh, Buoni not here for Kofidis. And they don't really have that many sprint options, I'm afraid, so don't expect the, the red of Kofidis to be up to the fore. But they may well prove me wrong uh, in the drama of what's about to ensue. Yeah, you never quite know with uh, with, with the riders from from Coffee. They they tend to all of a sudden if they haven't got their their main sprinter in Boani at, at the race, yeah, it gives the rest of the guys an opportunity to go for it, and uh, they tend to sort of pull something out of the bag every oh. every time really, where they're not necessarily the fastest guys and they're not necessarily challenging for uh, top honours, but certainly there or thereabouts all the time, and uh, they they they've got their lead out. Sorted out, and, yeah, um, and that tends to, to to sort of come through with every rider. Then, and they they just got that cool and calm about what they're doing and and setting the sprint up. So, um, I think they will feature certainly in the in the lead out at some point. This man, 38 seconds, and uh, I'm afraid this is a, a mob handed at the moment. The chase down, and it looks very effective. Nobody looks overly stressed. Apart from Astonar, of course, who've had a, a strip torn off them at, <laughs> overnight. Um, here comes Sky, and they're starting to really work for this. Christian Nace is getting himself into a very good position, and he's a he's a terrific man to punch a hole in the air on behalf of his teammates. And Viviani's getting essentially a free ride today because of the work that's been done by Astana and Katusha. And we've got uh, a moment here, as you can see, and on the deck, I'm afraid, that is uh, Pivenik for uh, uh, Lamprey, and um, Lamprey got bitten there, uh, likewise Androli. And I think that poor guy, that's Grosso, uh, Grosso, I think, has been down. He's been out a couple of times today, and he's uh, he's now getting rightly fed up with it. I think. There we are. Um, not a good day, I'm afraid. And others here. That was Andreas Schillinger of uh, Bora Aragon, who would have been a vital man if he was going to help out in the lead out, and uh, may have had a, a hope today of a top tenner. Well, it just goes to show with uh, with any racing in this uh, in this part of the world, uh, the safest place is to place to be is, is in the top 20 of the bunch, and uh, you, you just can't afford to drift back because 
down the back is where the majority of the crashes happen and uh, you t you're likely to end up getting down with it. Um, Pippo Pizzato, uh, Sven Eric is asking about today as we just look at this uh, bump right now. Um, well, they've got Moreshko and Balletti also there. Who do you see? Uh, well, that was Pippo. We just saw uh, Pizzato uh, was it just missing that, missing that, uh, that crash there, and he's now chasing to get back into the bunch again. So, cool. not the wisest thing um, to, to to waste that amount of energy at this point. So, just get yourself near the front and uh, and make sure you hang out there. Um, Moreshko un unfortunately didn't didn't take start this morning, and um, with that is. Uh, Unfortunately, not here because I was looking forward to uh, to watching uh, Jacopo Moresco to uh, to see how he uh, he would fare against some of the top sprinters. Hmm. Um, just um, uh, just having a quick double check. Um, I've still got Modolo as uh, live in this race. Um, have you spotted him yet? I haven't actually seen him yet. No. No, uh, neither have I. So uh, it may well be that he didn't take the start as was reported earlier. Uh, but Lamprey certainly look lively and up for it. Tinkoff likewise. Um, uh, Yuri Sagan went quickly, incidentally, on uh, the sprint yesterday. Brother of Peter finished in eighth place um, uh, just in front of Deby and Haller. Reasonably quick, reasonably decent performance by um, the, uh, the second uh, Sagan. Yeah, definitely. He's, he's certainly a very, very good bike rider, although not quite the quality of his brother. But, um, you know, you can't can't take him out of the equation. It's Tony Martin staying very much uh, in the centre of proceedings. He'll have his fun, of course, uh, on uh, the time trial. May well have a, a go at tomorrow's sprint stage as well. There's two phases to tomorrow, remind you. We're on at 09.30 UK time tomorrow morning, so uh, 10.30 Central European time for those watching on the, the continent. So it's getting nervy. We've only got 13.6 kilometres to go, and we're all together. Pim Lickdart has finally been uh, uh, absorbed within the group. Rompot also have a, a certain liveliness about them today. They got themselves in the break, but it's likely to be the kings of sprint. And um, one feels that Kittel, I haven't really, I haven't actually caught sight of him yet. I must admit his uh, broad shoulders and his uh, determined demeanour. That's um, probably a good thing, though. Yeah, probably a very <laughs> good thing. And uh, likewise, Andre Greipel, he's been hiding well. We saw him at the uh, top of the day, but um, you can see as well. I just, I haven't, I haven't spotted Luke Rowe today, which is no. uh, a bit... I wonder what www.veniza.be, I, I bet it's a pastry shop. Um, 12, 12.9 <laughs> uh, kilometres remaining of today. And there's the Flam Rouge that will mean something very much so next time by. Now, we said that the bell might well announce something. There is a big right-hand turn almost Usually immediately after it. One. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's what it does announce. <laughs> Just watch yourself. Um, immediately after the uh, this start-finish straight of our laps, there is a, a rather focused right-hand turn, Magnus. Now, that will thin them down if anyone takes it at pace. They don't look like they're overly minded to box clever for the time being. Is somebody going to pick it up and go for these bonus seconds on this rush? Uh, no, definitely. I don't think so. It's too close to the finish. Uh, but I just spotted Marcel Kittel there being looked after by his uh, ethics team. So uh, Kittel definitely in the mix of things. And uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that he will be... Uh, very keen to make this uh, a good one. There's our leader's jersey, uh, bottom left of your screen as it was a few seconds ago. And that, uh, as you can see now, right hand side, you see the leader's jersey. It's white with orange accents, almost like epaulets. And uh, I wonder if anyone's going to be tempted just to uh, push off for this because there's a, a benefit to it. If it does string out, then you get to take that nasty right hander before anybody else, and they are teeing themselves up for it. It's in Dorica Greenedge that are, are having a, a go and looking lively. Here they are, uh, Katusha just try and mob it at the front right now. So there we are um, at the line they're coming through right now. 11.5 kilometers remaining of today, and um, 
Well, there we are. It's a no rusher, actually. So uh, it's just for honor by the looks of things that they'll take the bell. So uh, no bonus seconds up for grabs. But there is that right hand corner and that's what they're going for. I believe they want to be first into it. Katusha shaking heads. There's all kinds of uh, conversation. There's Andre Greipel just going through off your screen as well. A lot of conversations being issued here. Um, a lot to talk about, particularly after this next turn. Greipel just being told there's a big right hander coming up and we're on the wrong side of the road to take it because they're going to get squeezed in the middle. There's the man who collects um, Sampha. So uh, um, representation and, and there it is. I wonder how much he's charging, 40 gropes by the looks of things. Um, it's a uh, seaweed as a vegetable. Um, they take the turn and it does really pinch and you can see how it stretches out and it's going to be like that at every one of the right-handers that they take. Yeah, it definitely will be and uh, the, the pace is obviously got to get, get driven up here now in the final uh, 11 kilometres of, uh, of today's stage. Still a bit early to really start scrambling for position though. You want to stay as calm as you can. You see uh, Tony Martin there on the left-hand side of your picture with uh, Marcel Kittel a few wheels further back. They're already now starting to think about moving up here. I would just stay nice and quiet right where they are and, and not spend too much time in the, in the wind. Nervous times, pace being picked up, and it's quick step split either side of the road for the time being, but it shows their intent. They've got all personnel where they need to be and some reserves as well. And what reserves for Kittel? He's looking very handy. And look, they drift through, they find space. That is one heck of a lead-out train that Marcel Kittel is assembling for us right now. Yeah, but it's it's way too early to move anywhere near the front, you know. They they keep on doing this uh, time after time and uh, and a lot of the time lately they've, they've come up short when when the pace really needs to be get get driven up so they want to just make sure that they keep it nice and calm and stay out of stay out of the wind as much as possible but in a position where they can move up so um They've got so many personnel, I, I guess they've still got some options, uh, even if they do fry a few. Uh, Sky come to the fore then. Interesting to see that it's the uh, Danny Van Poppel who wears the blue jersey on behalf of... Uh, um, in fact, it's by rights, he has the Rush's jersey. There he is. Um, mouth agape, it's Nace that's doing the pacing for him for Team Sky at the moment. They're on the radio as well. It's Viviani, though, the chosen son, at the back just for the time being, and he's... Um, he's keeping that rather angular nose of his in the wind, Concord style. Uh, 9.8 kilometres to go. It's getting nervous. Yeah, it is starting to get a bit nervous, and um, it, Team Sky now taking over the the pacemaking. But I, I can't emphasise enough how early this is in the uh, on, on this particular circuit. You want to make sure that you are coming out of that turn onto the sort of coast road should we call it um, in in front row and uh, at that point having a serious amount of manpower left because uh, it's not really at this point where you need to be uh, on the front um, it's the final kilometer and a half or two maybe um, but usually I would I would make the calculations on on probably about four riders going into the final kilometers to to really make a lead out uh, proper um, certainly at least three Luke Rowe started the day 39 seconds down, Magnus. Yeah, he did, but I'm, I'm yet to spot Luke, and I don't mm. know if he's uh, if he's had some sort of a, uh, an issue or maybe a, a, a small little uh, sort of cold or something like that that they obviously been uh, been very wary about in in Team Sky and making sure that he gets rested and gets over that in time for uh, for Tour of Flanders is certainly uh, um, a more important race for uh, for Luke and uh, for the rest of the team. Well, wow. um, Bora also engaging with the day. Um, Shane Archibald is their lead man. They've got Jan Barter in there as well. But really, it's all about Etix Quickstep and what they're doing. And here come Lotto, and they're, they're working to punch a way through. It seems that all the main sprinters now, their teams, they've called for them to be at the fore. And that's exactly where they are right now. Sky for Viviani, we assume, today. Um, of course, there is Greipel with the red of Lotto Sodal. And Marcel Kittel on the other side of the road right now, likewise, his Etix Quickstep boys working so hard for him. Who's Boris' choice then for this? Uh, it's a good question. I think Scott Thwaites has been going well this year, but uh, Jan Barta as well has uh, certainly been, been looking good. Um, I don't know. I think uh, Shane Archibald has certainly in the past been, been very fast in the sprint, but he's also been on the ground a couple of times today. So. I don't, I'm not sure whether it's uh, it's the right 
way to go with him. I think right now Team Sky are making a massive mistake here by, uh, by, by sort of being on the front and riding this hard this early. They just need to wait, getting onto the wheels of, uh, of Ethics on the other side and uh, just keep themselves in that position where they can get out, but they're not actually on the front. 7.5 kilometers to go. It seems that uh, all of the major sprint teams have been tempted to take some wind right now. Um, Mezget and Orica Green Edge, they've been reasonably quiet. Are they going to play a, a sensible one? They're just on the back, but uh, hidden beautifully, uh, hidden by or screened by Etix Quickstep, Astana, and indeed Lotto Sadal at the moment. Well, I think. Uh Orca Greenish has certainly got a, a, a good opportunity here with Luca today, and, and they're, they're playing the um, the wheels of the other riders and, and going with them rather than... Careful, everybody. Lots yeah. of street furniture here, and some just decided to take a, a cycle path. They've had a preview of this, and one rider has now been clipped off, and I'm hoping it's <laughs> it doesn't look like Gripple, but he has to uh, rage into another section here, just find a gap and get in, and that's a dangerous move, and one that gets you way out of position. Yeah, he doesn't. He didn't do a, a good one on that one, but uh, you know, at least they they all stayed upright. So, still Sky on the front. Chabanel doing a big pacing job as well uh, for Direct Energy here. Uh, Antoine Duchenne is is not a bad sprinter, but uh, I'm not sure who else uh, would be there. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's Chabanel himself. He wants to just. Uh, squeeze off and go for it. 6.4 kilometers to go, though. Sky in control just for the time being, but um, are they going to squeeze the life out of their own sprint? That's the big question. Well, not necessarily out of their own sprint, but certainly out of uh, out of the, the potential leader. But I don't know, Viviani may have just have said, look, guys, I just want to make sure that I'm in the front, I'm safe for as long as I can be, and as long as you can keep me up here, and then I'll just uh, try and run the wheels of the other, other teams later on. So... Um, Obviously, the, the, the sort of this part of the circuit, and uh, until we get out onto the uh, onto the main sort of coast road, then um, that's where the dangers are. If, as soon as they're into the final kilometer or so, then uh, they can just leave him be, and, and uh, the pace will be high enough for, for for Viviani to find his own wheels, and ideally the wheel of uh, Marcel Kittel, I believe. Big turn at the bottom of the course. It's a strange shape, but essentially um, a rectangle, and they start to head up. A melted rectangle, you understand. Um, they, they they head up and back towards the coast to uh, Coxida Bad. Um, 5.6 kilometres to go, and there is our leader on the white line, essentially. As you can see, the the well, I know there's a number of white lines, but on the left-hand side of the road, and there he is with four Katusha, three Katusha riders in front of him. So he's right at the back of his own train, Viviani likewise, and here is Tony Martin, and he's just uh, handing over duties for the time being, having done a great turn on the front. There's Greipel's men as well, and you see the face of Greipel himself uh, ready for action. They're all lined up together at the moment. You have uh, Christoph here, you have Kittel here, you have Viviani here, and you have Greipel. No disrespect to the other sprinters, but really, we've got some absolute sprinting royalty on display for you right now with five kilometers to go. It's getting nervous, it's yeah, getting pinchy as well because the street furniture and the pennant man, the men with the whistles, are doing their job. Everyone being warned, and if you want to move up, then you're going to have to move around and find a way through. It really is nipped at the moment. It'll be nip and tuck as we get to the last 4.7 kilometres to go. A couple of right-handers still to take on this strange blocked circuit we're on. Yeah, definitely, and uh, th this this next right-hander coming out onto the coast road is going to be uh, be a key one for for all the riders to to get through that one safely and uh, and still in position. After that, it's uh, a sort of a, a cross tailwind for for a long period of time as we now swing out onto that particular road, and uh, the pace will get extremely high here. And they've probably felt in the past as well in the last couple of laps now that there is a slight bit of crosswind, and hence why everyone is is scrambling for position coming onto this particular road. Um, they'll take a gentle right, then a gentle left. There'll be a gentle drift right again to the two kilometers to go marker. That is a big right-hand turn. It's a 90 degree -er before we get onto the arrow straight road to finish. Yeah, interesting to see uh, Lars back on the front for Lotus Sudal there. He kind of put his hand up and just said, look, calm it down, calm it down. We don't need to be right on the front. We're in a position that, that where we're happy and uh, we've been covered by Team Sky here, so we don't actually have to push too much wind on our own. 
Still can't get close enough to see if Modola's in the house, but Ferrari most certainly is, and he's got a, a decent lead out here uh, for uh, Lamprey. Here we are, just on the right-hand side of your picture in uh, goal, in pink, and indeed um, uh, pink uh, and, uh, and blue as uh, they are. And I still can't see him. No, um, I think it's for, for, uh, for uh, uh, Marco Kump that they're riding today. So uh, Lamper still giving it an option and uh, giving Kump the uh, opportunity. All the Ferrari in front of, of Kump there. So uh, they've got two cards to play, but Ferrari's doing an awful lot of uh, riding in the wind right now. He is, um, and it is uh, Kump. It's Marco Kump, so no Sasha Modolo. Uh, DNS at the top of the day we were hearing so Etix quick step still don't like the boxing I'm not surprised they've seen all the street furniture maybe that's what it's about just stay safe and um, that's what Viviani I believe was calling for because some of the road is has only been three meters wide so they drift to one side in order to take the next turn but the one that really counts is at two k's to go it's a big right hander yeah, it certainly is. And uh, Orica Greenwich coming up here now, trying to move in onto the wheel of, of um, Marcel Kittel. And that is the wheel that everyone wants to be on. So it's always a hard fought wheel. Sometimes you're actually better off just sitting back and waiting a bit and just coming up the f very fine, just as they hit full full gas. That's when you come up and just slam yourself onto the wheel and, um, and, oh. and, and take it over. A lot of elbows uh, and, and shoulders going on here in the battle for position. Primacy That's... on the road is what they're looking for at the moment. Who are Tinkoff working for today? Well, Tinkoff, um, may, well, may, maybe perhaps. Sagan. Uh. Well, maybe Euro Sagan, he had a good finish yesterday. Here we are. Uh, Chavanel's also very much involved here for uh, direct energy. Two kilometres, big turn coming up right now. And in a very safe place, our Etix quick step. This may be quite rudimentary. Uh, uh, Viviani is on his own. He's dispatched with his team for now. He wants to do it and latch on to somebody else's train. And that's exactly where he is. You've got four riders here from Etix quick step, one of whom is Marcel Kittel. And on his wheel is Viviani. There we are, Flam Rouge already been hit so the tick is wrong is it uh, maybe just an ad we've got uh, 1.6 remaining apparently so here we are then 1500 meters now and still they charge it Greipel's waiting to pounce and uh, looking lively as well this will be for Mads Pedersen by the way Stolting services are also here in the blue and white uh, so a late call by the young 20 year old who went well yesterday won the under 23s in Gent Bevelgem and he wants to have a play again today Borra in a bit of a mess as you can see as they finally do go under the Flamme Rouge tickers out right now and still doing the pacing it's Enix quick step hasn't been released just yet and there is uh, our leader Alexander and Christoph just boxed in for the time being. Doesn't look like it's going to be him, but the big man's coming up. But there's bigger men here potentially on an out and out sprint. We'll see. Kittel, when's he going to be tempted to go for this? That's the big question for the time being. Uh, spoiling work being done by Katusha. Roll to the front and get in the way of just about everybody. Kittel, is he going to go for it? He's waiting for the release. He's holding, holding, holding. He's got his lead out man just in front of him. And there is Viviani waiting to go as well. Also getting involved is Mezgetz. Is it all too late for Earth? Uh, the, the leader as well, Christoph, who goes first. Christoph goes dead centre of the road. He lights it up now versus Kittel. Kittel by the barriers with Viviani. Will Viviani manage to pop out and mug him at the line? 50 to go. Here comes Viviani. Viviani's going to get this one, I think. Oh, it does so. Bang, he says. How about that? That is a roar of a man who absolutely needed that victory. Good job. Great job by Viviani. He uh, he got himself onto the right wheel at the right time and was just cool enough to stay on Marcel Kittel. Kittel got dropped off a little bit too early though by Sabatini and um, had to well open the sprint. Marcel Kittel, um, Andre Greifel coming up and just saying you know good sprint but just a bit too early. Um, some strange and rather combative looking Rams wandering the uh, I think they're estuary estuary lamb they produce if I'm not mistaken look more like goats frankly but um, yeah there's a salty flavor to it once again quick look at uh, Viviani just keeping it very very cool he's uh, been aggrieved a couple of times on uh, quick days both track and road but this one really counts for something very very special indeed Viviani look at the the reaction to his face as well <laughs> <laughs> Job well done by Viviani and Team Sky. Well, we thought that the team had gone a little bit too early and were taking too much wind, but uh, uh, they took less 
in, in effect than Etix Quickstep, who did a lot of the driving work in the last 12 Ks, didn't they? Well, I think uh, Sky actually planned on on that happening, and uh, like I said before, you know, they, they were just looking to keep Viviani out of it. But let's hear from him. Uh, congratulations, Eli, you did it. Sabatini did a, a, a great job. Le, uh, leading Greipel and then <laughs> he's met. That was what he said anyway. Yeah, my, my teammates uh, um, did so well to... Sapevo anche che il vento era to, uh, I just had to take the right train and I knew that with, uh, with the likes of uh, uh, Kittel, Greipel around, I had to keep it cool. I had 100 meters to try and pass Kittel. And I'm very, very happy because uh, it's a great moment for me right, right now. I haven't made too many big results of late. I have some goals, and this was part of my the goals that I set myself. So I'm very, very happy. So what about the rest of the goals for the season? Oh, well, after Paris-Roubaix, I've got to rest just a little bit because uh, I'm at the very limit but the Giro d'Italia will be very very important to me he says no surprise it will be Christoph leads this race by a margin of five seconds ahead of Alexei Luchenko you Vestra as you were yesterday I guess but Christoph gets some more bonus seconds to add to his tally extends his lead to five with one day of racing and two elements to it tomorrow to go No rain today, but a thunderclap has been announced by Elliot Viviani. Don't take this man lightly, no matter how good you are. It's busy. Tomorrow, stage 3A. Uh, in the morning, 111 kilometers. One for the quick men. You never know. Viviani again. Who knows? Uh, then it will be the individual time trial, 14.2 kilometers. And then, of course, it's Scourge your lawns. Four, Tour of Flanders, and a week later, Paris-Roubaix. There is so much cycling on your home of cycling. It's almost rude, but we love it, and we know you do too, so keep it right here.